today when we started off, David Marins had a short clip today, kind of summing yesterday up. And being a native of Kansas, uh, I actually say that to a lot of my clients and colleagues, Toto. I don't think we're in Kansas anymore when I get feared out. So in, in any case, thank you, David, for remind, reminding me that I'm no longer in Kansas. Um, <coughs> thank you to the ARF, to David and Bob for kind of putting this uh, great conference together. Um, I know from the fact that Arbitron has been in, uh, a partner with the ARF since the inception. And really when this was created, it was almost a half day, I think, where it was just getting together all media types, colleagues, vendors, and agencies and advertisers to really advance some of the key topics of this industry forward. And I think that they've really done that this year. Um, we've heard a lot of different things about single source, holy grail, um, cross-platform measurement. So uh, there's a lot of things of hot topic on here. And we, want, we at Arbitron wanted to kind of thank some of our partners because what we want, are trying to do and accomplish is to advance, take one step at a time, move the ball forward, and really advance this conversation to ultimately what we want to have is our advertisers, agencies, and vendors happy with the service of measurement. Uh, and some of those partners I want to include, obviously, ESPN, who is up here, as well as CBS, NBC, and Turner. Without these great partners, none of this would be possible. Give you a little background on Arbitron. Arbitron, um, we're a little bit over 50 years old. Uh, we're currently measuring media in over 280 local markets in the U.S. and Puerto Rico. Uh, we are one of the proud uh, companies that were selected out of the two for this Coalition for Innovative Media Measurement, or SIM, for the three screen test. I'm gonna give you an overview of what presentation we're gonna look at today. So ESPN and Arbitron in November of 2010, we took a look at the consumption of ESPN national cable television and radio. The football games and the studio programs were on TV on ESPN, ESPN2, and ESPN News. Uh, we also included ESPN local radio, total day listening. Arbitron wrote, reported both in-home estimates, out-of-home estimates, and platform duplication. PPM measurement at the time in 2010 was in 39 um, metros, and our panel was about 42,000 consumers across the country carrying around the PPM device each and every day. The panelists actually carry a cell phone-like device that automatically con and continuously reports back data to Arbitron. It's audio-based and it, no matter where it occurs. So ultimately, we are measuring the person, not the media. So just to give you a quick background for those of you who may be new to Arbitron. So PPM encoding, uh, we, what we do is we actually encode the broadcast or online content. Now this code, you can't hear it, I can't hear it, dogs, cats can't hear it. The only thing that actually can actually hear it is the PPM device itself. So this is the meter. It's worn by individu individuals that are six and older, and it, it acoustically captures any of the encoded audio signals for the consumers. From that data set, it's magically sent back to Arbitron and collected in Columbia, Maryland. And with that, uh, I, I want to uh, bring on ESPN, but more than likely, uh, I also want to thank them for also sharing the insights from this study and helping move forward this important topic of cross-platform. Thank you. Thank you, Lung. And I also have a shout out to begin with. I, uh, somewhere out there is Jen Carton of, of Arbitron. Um, I hear a whoop, that must have been it. Uh, the 20 some odd vendors or suppliers who've been involved in ESPN XP have discovered that we're alarmingly hands on with these projects. And Jen was the person who helped us uh, whip the data into shape, get the uh, deliverable all set uh, so that we could analyze the data and present it to you today. So thanks a lot for putting up with us over that period of time. And I'm sure you're looking forward to the next one. So why is ESPN interested in radio? A, a better question might be why isn't everybody interested in radio? It would show you that we put some data together. We put Nielsen, Arbitron, Comscore, MRI data together, and our estimates showed, uh, this was late 2009, that radio represented something like one in four minutes of media use and maybe one in 
in six minutes of uh, media use on ESPN properties. Uh, now, this is a combination of sources. Obviously, media has moved on since 2009, so if we did the exercise today, it might look somewhat different. But the point is that radio represents comparable number of users and minutes to the internet. And yet, my little, the email updates that I get flooding my inbox every day are all talking about digital, and rarely do they talk about radio. But for us, we understand that radio represents an enormous amount of usage by sports fans. It's a critical channel of information about the sports that they follow. It's a way to connect with our fans locally. And we were very glad to have the opportunity to, to get a look at the use of ESPN content on both TV and radio during the football season. Now, this project is part of the ESPN XP initiative. And ESPN XP was originally announced at the ARF Rethink uh, in March of 2010. It encompasses all of our cross-platform research, so it's sort of the umbrella, bland, brand, uh, umbrella brand of all of our cross-platform research. And it has basically three main goals. The first is to move cross-platform research from a special project, and it's still pretty much a special project, to a standard practice, so we can share sources and methods across the industry. Second, to help advertisers and agencies to create media plans that follow consumers throughout the day on the best available platform. And lastly, we're not trying to replace existing currencies. Uh, we're trying to get them to work together. And the audience portion of cross-platform research, is, which is what Kelly and I work on, basically, we're trying to understand multi-platform users and their usage. Now, if all we cared about was their usage, that actually would be pretty easy. We, would, we could actually say, we're done right now, because we could take existing sources of minutes of usage and just stack them together. And in this case, we're looking at our World Cup usage. This is World Cup time consumption of ESPN brands. And you're looking at 29.4 billion minutes of TV viewing to matches, and then using Omniture. By the way, Lung asked if it was OK if he mentioned Turner and NBC and CBS. And I said, yes, it's OK, as long as I could put Nielsen data up on my slide. <laughs> so 29.4 billion minutes of TV viewing. And then we add another 4.9 billion minutes of digital usage that we measure from Omniture. And so, you know, we get 34.2 billion minutes of usage, or a 17% lift from digital. So all, if all we care about is minutes of usage, that's actually pretty easy. But we're not just interested in usage. We're also interested in the multi-platform user. And what's hard in this is to look at how the various users of each platform overlap. So there are people that watch TV, they use mobile devices, they're on the internet, they, they read magazines, they're listening to the radio. And the question is, in a given day, how many people are only watching TV? How many are watching TV and using the internet? How many are reading a magazine, listening to the radio, and watching TV? There's a lot of different ways for these circles to overlap. And this is where our existing measures can't help us, and where we really need to look at single source sol solutions to tell us how people overlap in their media use on the given day. So net reach, hard. What's even harder is getting the minutes back out of these user segments. So once you've done the proper overlap of the circles, what you then have to look at is how they contribute to the minutes of usage. So how many minutes are the TV-only group contributing? How many minutes are the TV and internet group continuing? How many minutes are the people who are using all five platforms contributing? This is very, very difficult. And yet, it, this is the way that, that we've done all the cross-platform research, that really, that we've done in ESP and XP. Basically, this approach we take from the minute we start a project. We break it down into the user cells, this behavioral segmentation. So in this case, assume that A means TV, and B is radio, and C is internet, and D is mobile. How many people only used one? How many people used two, three, four? And then how many minutes did they contribute to each of the platforms? So this is basically uh, the approach that, that we that we took. And in the case of the Arbitron study, the four elements we were examining, as Lung said, were consumption of football programming on our TV networks, listening to our radio affiliates, and then consumption of both of those indoor or in home and out of home. Now, when you put those four elements together, you get 15 user and usage cells. And this is just math. You know, if you put two things together, you get three cells. That's your classic only, only both. If you get put three together, you get seven. 4 gives you 15, 5 gets you 31. Now you're starting to see the importance of large sample size. 6 would get you 63, I guess, although I've never done that many. And the way that we named these cells, which is important if you're going to follow the rest of the presentation, is that the T represents watching TV. R means people that listen to radio. 1 means they did consumption in home. And 2 means they did consumption out of home. 
So for example, the T1s were people who watched TV and they only did so in home. The R2s were people that only listened to radio and they only did so out of home. The R12s listened to radio, but they did so in home and out of home. The TR12s used both platforms and they did both platforms both in home and out of home. And of course, none of this is to be confused with R2D2. All right, so I'm happy to report that Arbitron succeeded in actually populating all 15 user cells, and here they are. Our 15 user cells, they were projecting a population, they gave us a reach, the users, the minutes of contribution to each of the platform, the percent of usage that they constituted, and what I'd like everybody to do right now is to cover their right eye and read the fourth line. Right, so I get that it's an eye chart. But uh, what we're going to do is take you through the results of the study one step at a time. And to do that is Kelly Johnson. So what I'm going to attempt to do over the next few minutes is make something very complicated seem very easy. So we're going to start with reach. So with the Arbitron Personal People Meter, we were able to me measure TV and radio. So this is looking at the people who use TV and radio over the course of the month. So 95.2 million persons listen to the, uh, use TV, 25.7 listen to ESPN radio affiliates for a net reach of 99.4 million people, 84.3 million adults, and 43.4 million men. We can then look at shared and exclusive reach of each of the platforms. So back to that same 99.4 million persons, 73.7 .7 million of them only watch television, 4.2 million only listen to ESPN radio affiliates, and 21.5 million did both. So radio for us added 4.2 million persons exclusively exclusive reach of 3.5 million adults and 1.8 million men. Or another way to think about this, about a quarter of the users used radio, and most of those radio users also watch television. So with this project, we're not just limited to looking at platforms, we can also look at location. So back to that same 99.4 million users, 84.9 million of them used in-home, 61.2 million used out-of-home. And this should look familiar, but this is location. So we're shared and exclusive location. So of those 99.4 million persons who used ESPN, 38.2 only used in-home, 14.5 million only used out-of-home, and 46.7 million used in home and out of home. So out of home gave us an exclusive reach of 14.5 million persons, 12.4 million adults, and 6.1 million men. Another way to look at this is about two thirds of all users used ESPN content out of home. And only about 15% of those were out of home exclusive. So if we break down all of the users into uh, a pie, we can include um, TV by in home and out of home, and radio by in home and out of home. So that's what we're looking at here. And the pies look fairly similar, but there's a very interesting difference. So 85% of the TV users use TV in home. That was split um, by those who only used in-home and those who used in-home and out-of-home. And about 15% were exclusive out-of-home users. Radio, however, is a very different picture. About 84% used, used out-of-home, and only 16% exclusively used radio in-home. So let's look at reach in one additional way. So 69 million people, uh, million adults, used ESPN TV in-home. 
out-of-home TV accounted for 45 million persons, and radio, 22.5 million. So that 69 million persons who use TV in-home includes those who used only in-home and those who use TV in-home with some combination of either out-of-home TV or radio. But to that, you, in this study, we're able to get see the exclusive reach of those who only use TV out of home or used radio and no in-home TV. So we get an exclusive reach of 15.5 million adults or an additional reach of 23%. So Glenn mentioned earlier that getting time out of discrete user cells is pretty hard. But that's really a hallmark of all of the research that uh, ESPN has been doing with cross-media measurement. So we've talked about the 22% of people who used TV and radio, and the 47% of people who used in-home and out-of-home. When we look at the time that they spent, we can understand why, understa why getting to minutes used is so important, because that 22% who used, TV, who used ESPN content, um, TV, and radio, were 22% of the users and 43% of the usage. The multi-location user, who used both in-home and out-of-home, while 47% of the users is 74% of the total minutes spent with ESPN content. So these people are consuming more content overall because they're spending more time with TV and with radio. So for example, the multi-platform ESPN user spent nearly eight hours with TV over the course of the month versus about four and a half hours for the person who just used TV. They also spent four and a half hours with ESPN radio versus the hour of 41 minutes for the radio only group for a total of nearly 12 and a half hours over the course of the month with ESPN content. We saw the same pattern for multi-location users. So they were using just over seven hours of ESPN content in the home versus just under four hours for those who used in-home only, and two and a half hours out of home versus just under an hour for those who only used out of home for nine hours, 44 minutes a month with ESPN content. So this pie, instead of looking at users, we're looking at minutes by platform, by location. So 73% of all of the minutes consumed of ESPN content were done so with ESPN in-home television. Out of home, both radio and TV, add 20, are 21% of the total pie, where radio is 17% of the total pie, which is pretty close to the 16% that Glenn mentioned earlier from our other sources. So one of the things that we like to talk about is how can we get beyond the ratings? So what we would normally consider ratings is in-home TV. So overall, we had 31.7 billion minutes of ESPN content consumed over the course of the month. 22.6 billion of those were in-home TV, where radio and out-of-home TV added 9.1 billion minutes. For a 40% lift over what we would normally consider a rating or audience. So as you can imagine, the groups who consumed in-home TV and out-of-home TV, in-home radio and out-of-home radio were slightly different. So what you're looking at here um, on the top is the most female down to the most male. So it's an audience composition. So out-of-home TV was the most female, probably women and men together in an out-of-home location uh, consuming football content together while radio tend to be a much more male platform, with out-of-home radio, men in their cars or men at work listening to sports radio, the most male. So here we're looking at composition by age, with the youngest on the top down to the oldest. So in-home TV tended to be 
the youngest. Uh, out of home radio actually had the greatest percent of persons 25 to 49. Imagine people in their cars and at work with a greater opportunity to listen to radio. And in home radio, the oldest of all. So now we're back to the very complicated eye chart, so I'll turn it over to Glenn. Now that uh, Kelly's walked you through all the elements, probably this is self-explanatory, right? So if I could just have a volunteer from the audience to come up and... No, not, we're not there yet? All right, let's do this. Let's rank the 15 groups by the percent of usage that they represent. When we do that, what we see is that five of the 15 groups represent 77% of the users and 92% of the usage. So this, this clearly are our most important uh, groups, this top five groups. Um, just a word before we go to the next slide and look at the five groups in detail. This is a good example of why we emphasize usage above users, because about halfway down the chart, if you look at the T2 group, and this is people who are watching TV, but they are only doing so out of home, they represent one out of eight users. They were actually the third largest user group, but they did less than 2% of the usage. So you, you can look at users, and that's useful, but unless you consider their usage, you can be completely misled. All right. So each of these five groups uh, got to be big usage groups in different ways. So the T12s, watch TV both in home and out of home, they were a very large group. They represented nearly one in four users, and they were above average users. The average user spent 352 minutes with our content. They were spending 426 minutes with our content. So they were big in users. They were big in usage. So they ended up representing uh, nearly a third of all usage. The second group was the most complicated group. They were watching TV and listening to radio. They were doing both of those, both in home and out of home. They were a pretty small group. They were about uh, not even eight million uh, persons, but they were the largest usage. So they did 18 hours and 26 minutes of usage in the course of the study. And so although they were a small group, they had so much usage that they actually became the second ranked group in terms of the usage that they represented. The third group is the people that only watch TV at home. They were the largest group in terms of users, but they had below average usage. So the average user, 352 minutes, this was 221 minutes. So they were the third largest group in terms of usage accounted for, not because they did a lot of usage, but because there were so many of them in the group. The next two groups, sort of a mix of people watching TV and listening to radio in different locations, both of these smallish groups, both had above average usage, about the same amount, six or 700 minutes. And so they're pulling twice their weight in terms of usage. So they represent maybe 5% or 3% uh, or 2% of the uh, users, but they're doing 10 or 4% of the usage. And the rest of the group, you know, obviously a lot of people, but they're doing very little usage, and so they don't account for very much usage. All right, so each of these groups gets to be a big percent of usage in a different way. They also spend their time. I'm very proud of that animation, by the way. <laughs> That, that took ever so much time. This is how they spent their time with ESPN Media. So the easiest group to understand is the T1s because 100% of their 221 minutes was spent watching TV at home, right? The T12s are the second easiest to understand. They're just like the T1s except they've added, instead they're doing four out of five minutes of in-home TV and only one out of five minutes is they're doing out-of-home TV, right? However, they're doing 426 minutes of usage, so that 81% of in-home TV minutes is actually more in-home TV viewing than the T1s, who are a much lighter viewing group. All right, the second group is the most complicated, because again, they're, they're in all four of our elements, in-home and out-of-home TV, in-home and out-of-home radio. About half of their usage was in-home TV, and half of it was from the other elements. But notice that most of their TV is done in-home, and most of their radio is done out-of-home. The T1R2 group, they're doing everything except watching TV out of home, is very like the TR12 group, except they just lose that little bit of out of home TV. So they're very similar. The T12R2, this is confusing even for us, by the way. <laughs> what group did you say that was? The T12R2, we should have given them fancy names. See, that's where the segmentation is fun. Uh, the T12R2 group is doing everything except listening to radio in the home, so they're very like the T12 group, except they've added a little bit of out-of-home radio. And the thing to look at here is that the fourth and fifth groups here have similar amounts of usage, but again, they're getting to it in very, very different ways. One of them is, you know, primarily TV with a little bit of out-of-home radio. One of them is, you know, about half in-home TV, and, and mostly the rest of it is radio. And then 
the other, of course, is a mix of whatever was left. Okay, Kelly walked you through some characteristics that we found as we looked at uh, gender and age. And in this case, you find that the lessons apply when we look at the groups as well. So here we've stacked the groups from most female to most male. And again, the groups that have solely TV tend to be most female, and in-home is even more female than that. And then as you add radio and you add out-of-home usage, you get a greater percent of males in each of the user groups. Then if we look at age, these are sort of roughly stacked from youngest to oldest. Um, you can see that the T1 group, the group that's in-home TV only, is a mix of very young people and older people. And as you add radio, what you're really, you're not really adding older users, you're adding middle-aged users. You're adding middle-aged users as you add radio and you add out-of-home usage. So uh, when you get down to the group that's TR12 and they're doing both platforms and doing in both locations, they have the largest percent of persons Eight, uh, 25 to 49. What Arbitron brought to this project was they had passive electronic measurement of TV and radio. They had the ability to distinguish in-home and out-of-home usage, which is very, very important for sports consumption. And they had a very large sample size, which was required to, do, uh, to look at these really small groups that we were looking at. What ESPN brought to the table was we had this experience of doing this user and usage analysis by looking at behavioral segmentation and then the minutes that they contribute. Uh, we were able to fit the Arbitron project into our larger ESPN XP initiative. So this is just one part of our football uh, project. And of course we had uh, TV and radio content, uh, extensive TV and radio content that usefully for the PPM was encoded. So that really made it work. So here's the summary. We were able to do, we were able to create a, a, a pie of minutes. How did people spend their time? 73% of the time they were consuming in-home TV. 17% of the time they were listening to our radio content, and 21% of the time they were consuming our content out of home. We found that TV had mostly in-home users, that 41% of them were in both locations, that radio had mostly out of home users, but 58% were in both locations. And we found that uh, adding radio and adding out of home uh, usage contributed greater persons 25 plus and 25 to 49 uh, audiences. Finally, and this is consistent across all of our studies that we've ever done, we found that the multi-platform and the multi-location user were heavier consumers of ESPN content. Uh, the four elements that we looked at, uh, again, created 15 user and usage cells. Five of the cells came out as clearly the most important, contributing 77% of the users and 92% of the usage. Uh, and we were able to measure exclusive reach and usage from radio and out of home. So radio was adding 4.2 million persons, out of home was adding 14.5 million persons. And then if you compare radio and out of home to in-home TV, we found that we got a, a lift in reach of 15.5 million persons, or 23%, and a lift in minutes of 9.1 billion minutes, or 40% of usage. You gotta love a presenter who comes in under time. So I'm just going to take a minute to say that you can follow us on Twitter. Dave Coletti is not here, but he, I'm sure he'll be all a Twitter about this later. So we're ESPN Research on Twitter. Please join us. Uh, and I think if you, were con if you were equipped for questions, we have time for questions. It's uh, Mike Hess Nielsen. Hi. Hi, Mike. Um, the, the number show was great, uh, and I love the specificity of the groups. Um, could you talk a little bit about preliminary implications, like from a planning, um, you know, I, I, I don't want to make the assumption that the implications tell themselves, so if you could get into implications a little bit. Mike, I'm conducting pure research here. Um, I, I think part of it is that as we go out and uh, I guess the most obvious implications are to the business plan and our sales effort around uh, football and as we go into next football season, well, we have a greater understanding of what it means to add radio to your plan and, to, and what out of home that you're getting that's really not measured by traditional means means to your plan. So it's giving you reach and it's giving you usage you can't see and if you add radio, you know, you're reaching other people that you wouldn't reach if you were only doing uh, television. So it, it, it helps us paint a picture of, of usage. Uh, repeat the question, what was more surprising, the, the radio findings or, or, or the out-of-home questions? I guess maybe if there was a surprise for me, it was that the usage was so concentrated in the five cells, that there were certain kinds of behavior that people did, 
and certain kinds of behavior that not very many people did and they didn't do them very much. We also, there's a lot of findings that we did that we didn't even get into here, like the T2 group, which was a lot of people and didn't get a lot of usage. We looked at that, it was very, very female. It was people who were getting exposed to college football games in out-of-home locations. So that was pretty much what that whole behavior was. So we were able in some cases to define, define some of the behaviors when we looked at the specific properties uh, that, that they were consuming that we weren't able to do in the overall broad findings of the study. But yeah, to get the five in such a large, they represent such a huge percent of users was, of usage was a, was a big surprise. Well, it was, a, it was a moderate surprise. Good to see you. Thanks a lot.